about Vasudev Kutumbakam, how we must all learn about each other from childhood, about each other's culture, and accept and live together, together peacefully. So congratulations on organizing this virtual uh, virtual walk, which is amazing. I cannot imagine. I have done the actual walk, so this is amazing. Uh, I would like to mention briefly about uh, the uh, World Heritage Week. Uh, which is uh, actually celebrated from the 19th of November to the 25th of November uh, by UNESCO. UNESCO has designated this as the World Heritage Week and basic purpose being to create awareness of heritage worldwide. And this year's theme, I think we have very uh, uh, aptly chosen our, uh, our uh, activities because the theme for 2020 is shared cultures, shared heritage, and shared responsibility. Know that uh, this city has been home to various people, the Armenians, the Portuguese, the Jews, the Parsis, the Chinese, all of them have been staying here and they have been staying here as early as the 18th you know, uh, century. And the reason being that Calcutta was a very important place the second most important city after uh, London. So, not many people came here to try their fortunes here. Being the English, nor being the in, 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 in Indians, they made this great town where, if I might use the word, East met West. Bo Barracks tends to be synonymous with the community. And in fact, it's probably one of the most recognized and recorded um, Anglo-Indian neighborhood hubs. However, presently from that central location in Calcutta and the other adjoining areas, the community has dispersed to other places within the city, you know, such as Park Street, Ripon Street, Elliot Road, McLeod Street, a Wellesley area, Picnic Garden, Bihala. And these are the nodal areas where a considerable population of the community presently resides. For the purpose of research and discussion, the population of Anglo-Indians in this city can roughly be estimated to be around 30,000 persons. But in spite of this microscopic number, you know, when you look at it in relation to the total population of the city, their contributions to the city have been immense. Indian culture has, in a way, experienced an influence of um, predominant cultures in the city, other predominant cultures in the city. The Parsis in Calcutta, as we said, have been here over 250 years. And the contribution that they've made has been vast. Start with the first fire temple that was built here, which was called the Banaji Fire Temple. It was built by the Banaji family. Now, this was on Ezra Street. It was frequented by a number of people who had tremendous faith in this place. Unfortunately, it was a privately owned or family owned Agyari, and there were problems within the family as a result of which they decided to close. The D.P. Mehta Agyari, which is today at 91 Metcalf Street, came into being. But what you must learn about is when the Mehta family decided to have their own fire temple in their own premises, it was more a family place, they brought the fire down all the way from Nausari. Now, it worked beautifully. They came with priests from there and it was kept going right through. But when they reached Calcutta, they suddenly found that they had to cross the Howrah Bridge, which in those days was a wooden structure. And the point was that it had to be, the priest had to be in touch with something metallic, not wood. So there was a big thing on how they were going to cross that bridge. So they came out with a most ingenious uh, answer, where the priests wore steel-heeled, high-heeled shoes. So this was the first time that you had men wearing high heel shoes and walking in and carrying that fire across to the temple, which still stands to, the, uh, to their temple. This was the one which was taken to the, te uh, the family temple at uh, the Mehta residence. The city where Fahi and a scholar had come to uh, India, that's almost uh, 1700 years ago. There was an the exchange of uh, education and information Scholars went from uh, India to uh, China and then from China to India. They traveled over here. 
Then Huynh Sang was the next uh, traveler who came to India in about uh, our 650 AD and he studied in Nalanda University. After that, the, the first documented uh, settlement happened when uh, in Archipur, just, let me just talked about uh, when uh, Mr. Kong Archu came over here and was granted uh, 650 meters of land. It is said that he was given a horse and said, drive this horse as much as you can and whichever, whatever land you can cover, uh, that is yours, to set up your sugar factory. So that's how he came over here to set up a sugar plantation. He brought in Chinese workers uh, to work in the sugar plantation and the factory. And some say this is the first Chinese settlement, but uh, although undocumented, there has been there, there have been uh, the Chinese settlement in uh, in the central Kolkata long before that too, uh, where there was a very uh, thriving trade in opium and uh, silk. Uh, in fact, uh, the the Thago family has a very deep. Uh, our community came in about 1790 with Shalom Hakohen coming from Aleppo from Syria to actually look for trading opportunities. Uh, he first went to Surat and scouting to see what the opportunities were. He looked further east and saw the rising star of the British and the East India companies and the possibilities this could afford him for trade. So he was a jeweler, a court jeweler. Uh, he moved to Kolkata and he first started dealing with jewels and even was the man who weighed the Kohinoor diamond. He uh, was the person who traded and uh, met with many of the princes of India to sell jewels. Realizing that there was much more potential in India, very soon his family came to India, he called them, and said, this is a country of great promise. We are a trading community. We've always been traders across the Middle East and uh, he settled in Kolkata. Actually, it was, um, he was, they were all very religious people. We are Sephardic Jews, we're conservative people, and uh, our language actually is Arabic. We are Arab Jews, which people don't think of too often. We wrote uh, he Arabic in the Hebrew script, premises for a synagogue, which is the Nebi Shalom synagogue today. And that was where we started praying out of. Very soon, Jews from other parts of the Middle East, seeing the opportunities that were there under British India, also came and settled in Kolkata. And we became known as the Baghdadi Jews of India, even though the first ancestor, the first person was my ancestor, Shalom HaKohen, who was a Syrian Jew. We built three wonderful synagogues. Today, this oldest synagogue, uh, the Navy Shalom, is the newest synagogue. Now, that sounds weird, but uh, what happened was, is that we um, built it as the community grew the navy shalom was too small and so they decided to build the betel synagogue which i hope you'll see a couple of slides of will you be showing them a couple of slides of the synagogue yes yes, yes. So I, the betel. I call it the queen of the synagogues yes. in pollux yes. a very beautiful synagogue but as the jews prospered and did very well um s street is a is a very wealthy um a jewish businessman so david ezra and his family decided to build the magin david synagogue and they were going to break down the navy shalom and in that larger compound and build a very large synagogue, the Magin David. And most of the community was on board and they were going to do this. And when the beautiful Magin David synagogue was built, which you'll also see slides of, it's the largest synagogue in Asia. Also like the Chinese and the Parsis were very involved in the opium trade. That's where Jews made a lot of their money, especially the Ezra family. Uh, Parsis and Jews actually dominated that trade. At that time, it was legal. The Jews then also, when it became no longer possible to deal in opium, dealt in real estate and a lot of Calcutta's premier real estate was owned by uh, Jewish families. Uh, the Ezra family is the most well known, but there were many other wealthy Jewish families. For those of you all, because you all are uh, many students on this, and I'm sure many of you enjoyed going to the zoo like I did when I was a student, though I'm not sure if today's students enjoy the zoo so much, both the Gabe house and the Ezra house were donated by the Jewish community uh, to the city of Calcutta because they were also lovers of animals. Besides the three synagogues, we also have a Jewish girls' school. It's one of the oldest um, girls' schools in the city. I think it's about 1860 or 1880 that it was formed and it was formed for Jewish girls because they were worried about 
proselytization in the Christian schools. There's also a Jewish boys school, which still runs today. And we have a very large cemetery in Nakeldanga. So that tells you a little bit about our community. Um, we had a lot of people who were trailblazers. Much of this is documented in my archive, jewishcalcutta.in. But for students of today who may be interested in Bollywood, Jews played a major role in the development of Bollywood because women from other communities were not allowed to act. So some of the stars of both the silent screen and early Bollywood were Jewish actresses with Hindi names. And there's a wonderful video on YouTube for those who want to watch Koshalom Bollywood, which tracks it. Now, whilst we know about the Calcutta Jews, where the Baghdadi Jews, it's also important to know that there were other Jewish communities in India, one in South India, which is very different from ours, which came many, many years ago, and they're Malayali speaking. And then uh, the white Jews of Cochin, who came in the 16th century, which is a distinct community in, in uh, South India. I believe they're not even five or 10 members of that community left. Our largest community is the Ben Israel community. It's in Bombay. They actually believed to have come as part of um, when the destruction of the Second Temple happened. They lived for thousands of years in India, in villages along, along the Konkan coast. They still are the largest community in Kolkata, in India. They're about two or three thousand uh, Bene Israel Jews. They have their synagogues as well. And there was a Baghdadi community as well. What's interesting about the Jewish communities in India today is they're expanding. There have been two other Jewish communities, people who have claimed their Jewishness and been recognized by Israel as well, most importantly in the Northeast. So that tells you a little bit about a community. Of the Armenian community actually belonged to the Orthodox community. And the, the Armenia, the country, was the first to adopt Christianity. Uh, Armenians were very prominent. They were uh, in the in the business, and uh, around the 17th century, uh, Emperor Akbar invited the Armenians to come to uh, Calcutta, West Bengal, where they settled. Uh, they worked as merchants and dealt with spices, uh, silk, muslins, etc. And some also became architects. Several Armenians settled down in places like Chinsura, Kolkata, Chennai. Uh, Dhaka and Mushidabad and they were doing their businesses from there. They became very important in the trading community. Uh, a merchant named uh, Koja Petros, uh, he, he, uh, he constructed a bridge in Chennai over the seas of Adya River, uh, which is located on Armenian Street. It is still there till, till today. You can go and see there's a plaque where it's mentioned. Uh, several churches also were built by Armenians, uh, namely our main church, uh, Holy Church of Nazareth, uh, which is the second oldest church in Kolkata. And uh, it's around over 300 years old, like you mentioned Nafri earlier. Uh, it was built in 1707 and then um, uh, a fire took place and it was rebuilt again in 1724. Then we have churches in Park Circus, North Range. We have our church in Mushidabad and Chinsura. And um, after the Armenians' independence in, uh, from the USSR, uh, many Armenians returned back to their homeland. And uh, now there are hardly 200 or 250 Armenians left in India. And this includes the, uh, the numbers of the school children also. So the, the community has dwindled a lot. Uh, the Armenian Church uh, is a charitable organization who takes care of the community by uh, providing allowances, medical and accommodation to the people. <clears throat> Besides our community, we also help out other people who are in need of assistance. Uh, we have set up a lot of medical centers in, in hospitals like RG Car, Dum Dum Municipal, Municipality, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, the Rotary Shankar Netralaya for the eyes, um, and um, uh, you know, and uh, we have also put up a, a, a center for the uh, called Anandagar for the AIDS children. Uh, this we have uh, we have helped out in many ways by, uh, by, by donations and by giving equipment uh, to these hospitals, and uh, which has really come handy for the people. Uh, even um, this. Um, Institute of Neurosciences, which is on Park Circus opposite Malik Basar. We have funded there too and uh, we have uh, opened up a center there also.
also. So in this way, Armenians have been very helpful out and although the numbers are dwindling, but uh, we are carrying on and now with little mixed marriages, we hope to uh, increase the population and uh, we also have a school called the Armenian uh, um, uh, Philanthropic Academy where we have boarding section for the children and children come from Armenia, they study, they do their uh, college and they go back and some children are sponsored also to different uh, countries uh, but this is how we carry on and uh, the culture, the food, uh, we have our special dishes, very famous ones like a um, uh, famous one is called dolma where it's a stuffing of mince and meat uh, into uh, grape leaves then there are different type of kebabs and barbecues and uh, there is a sweet dish called baklava very much like the Turkish uh, uh, sweet name but uh, we have our foods but our foods are not spicy at all they, uh, they are meant you know with less spice so this is this is uh, all I have to say about the Armenian community